Hello and welcome to a new episode of Bring It Up. My name is Chiara. And me, Sara. Hello. How are you guys? Welcome back to a new episode. We kept you waiting for a while, but now we're back with a new and very interesting, as I hope, episode. Let's start from this. I will give you three letters. ESC. But this time we're not speaking about the European Solidarity Corps. We are speaking about the Eurovision Song Contest. This is a festival that brings singers together from all over the world, mostly. And um, there are so many social and cultural aspects that are developed during the, the year, across the years, such as representativity of the LGBTQ plus community, social inclusion, and also international cooperation. So let our guest uh, deepen into the topic. And Sarah, would you like to introduce him? Yes, of course. So probably you already know him because he was one of our guests in our pre previous episodes. So Alex, welcome back. How are you? Hi, I'm Alex. Uh, you know me from a previous program, I guess. And I will try to give you some anecdotes and some, let's say, expert point of view on Eurovision. And as Chiara, you said before, it's so curious that it's the same capital letters, Eurovision Song Contest. And that's one of the reasons I decided to do this volunteer. No, I'm joking. It's not because of that, but <laughs> no, 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 it's not because of that. But I, I, I thought about it later, yeah. So, yeah, we will talk about Eurovision and some anecdotes and some things related with politics and social inclusion. I mean, for our listeners, you have to know that Alex is a super fan of Eurovision and he got us into it too, because neither me, <laughs> neither me or Chiara were very uh, big Eurovision fans. But thanks to Alex, we started to get really into that. And now... We also we were also following all the other um, nations' uh, decision about Eurovision contestants for this year and seeing and then commenting of all the songs that they are brought this year to uh, to Rotterdam because this year um, the the contest is going to be held in Rotterdam, right? Because last year I think it was Netherlands who won. So. Alex, if you want to tell us more about Eurovision, you can start. And also just one thing is probably, probably the very first thing that uh, led us to record this episode is the Kahoot that Alex organized for us. So a lot of knowledge exactly. we have now comes exactly <laughs> from those 20 questions. <laughs> yeah, the, the thing is that uh, we will we'll discuss it later, but... Um... I, the, the first memory I have about Eurovision, I think I was like seven years old and it was 2003. And here in Spain, we watched the contest called Operación Triunfo, which is like the San Remo of Italy, in order to choose the singer who goes to Eurovision. And it was a program that everybody watched in Spain. And then uh, there was like faith in that that winner could win Eurovision. And since then, I remember watching it with my mom. And it's an event that at least in Spain, um it's something that gathers the family together and the friends. So uh, it's not only watching the contest and who wins, but also like a night where you have dinner, you gather with your friends, you hear other languages, you spend the night with your family. It's like a magical night somehow that you wait for it all along the year. And uh, uh, it depends on where you're from, that you live it in a, in a way or a different way, let's say. Uh, in the Nordic countries, since ABBA won Eurovision in the 70s, everybody started to watch it and prepare their own national selections that got bigger and bigger. Some other countries, uh, like the French-speaking countries, they follow it in more in the beginning, but now you feel like the young generations don't feel that attached to it. And some other countries, like Greece, for example, they, they follow it because they have also their music programs in their countries that they can relate to. And they have win in this case in 2004 and 2005, sorry. And uh, it's, you know, that we are the same generation. It's a contest that is broadcasted all around Europe and even outside. But depending on the tradition, uh, you can feel more or less attached. I don't know if you both as Italian, which was your your previous knowledge before getting into the topic and if you feel that young people feel connected 
with this contest? Yeah, as I said before, I wasn't really uh, a big fan of Eurovision. I knew about that, but I have never watched it, actually. Because I feel like in Italy, um, as the, um, the music contest in which, during which, uh, the um, singer of the Eurovision is decided, is, uh, chosen, uh, is even more, um, popular than the Eurovision contest itself. So people usually, um, follow Sanremo contest, festival, Sanremo festival, and they don't really realize that that singer and that song that is, um, the winner in Sanremo Festival is the one that is going to be uh, presented at Eurovision because Sanremo, I think, is just an, an historical piece in in Italy and it's super, super famous. Everybody watched it, except for me because I didn't like it, but um, I think it's it's much more popular than Eurovision itself. So I don't know about you, Chiara, but for me, for example, in my family, no one ever watched Euro- Eurovision ever. So... Yeah, now that you were speaking, I was realizing that probably we have, we as Italians have a different perception of what Eurovision is. Because if I'm not wrong, one of the questions of the quiz were exactly about the fact that uh, Eurovision is based on uh, Sanremo. So probably like for us is the other way around. I mean, as you said, like it's so important for us, but also we don't feel the same uh, influence of the Eurovision because it's something that derives from what we already had. I don't know, Alex, what do you feel about it? Mm. I have, it makes sense what you're saying, to be honest, because this, like, for the ones who are listening yesterday, Sweden uh, selected their representative. We have been following for like one month and a half. <laughs> so it's not something fast. It's something that it lasts forever. <laughs> and... Uh, the contest is so... Yeah. Oh, well, I, yeah, just one thing that yesterday for our list day is going to be last Thursday because ah, the event is going to be out on Monday, so it's going to yeah. be last Thursday, just to last, clarify. Okay. <laughs> so um, the contest is so big in their country also that they take more into consideration who is winning Melody Festivalen than, okay, they are going to your region and they follow it also. They follow it more than in Italy. They follow it a lot. But uh, the contest is so big by itself that it's, uh, it's not only the way of selecting the representative, but uh, a concept on itself. And there's some countries that happens this, not that much. For example, in Spain, it's a mess because every year we change the way of selecting. And this way you don't create like a... You don't create a way and a path for people to get involved in the selection. And sometimes it's just like the bro- the public broadcast saying, okay, this year is going this year. And there's no contest in between. Some other years we use a reality show. Then the winner goes like the X Factor kind of thing. Uh, another time we do like a, another program that it's the first time we do it. So It's a bit like the way each country selects their entry also affects of the level of attachment of the people in the the selection, in the whole festival, let's say. Okay, so maybe Alex, you can tell us a little bit more about how Eurovision works uh, and how it's held, when it was um, created the first time and what is now, let's say. Yeah, just uh, like a brief introduction, like for the ones who don't know, it was uh, created in the 50s and only seven countries took part of it. And it was basically the countries more like of a French speaking language, Uh, Switzerland, also the Netherlands, but they don't speak French, but also Luxembourg. Uh, Yeah, so these countries, uh, the main objective is for Europe after the war to show that they were able to get united again and and be able to broadcast a live program all around Europe. So it was both a, like a techno- technological test for them to try to make something big broadcasted all around, but also like a, a cultural and like kind of a reborn thing after the war of getting together, singing together and kind of celebrating. And since then, it has been Every like it's considered the oldest pro the oldest TV program in history because it has not stopped for the years this and less until last year, which is fun. like I could never think in my life that the Eurovision would not take place. But then the pandemic came and obviously 
it couldn't take place as the Olympics or as many other events. So basically, uh, uh, there's some basic rules nowadays that have changed over the years, but maximum six people can be on the stage and three minutes maximum song. And the televoting and the jury will decide who is the winner in the, in the country that wins. Uh, normally host the contest the following year. If this year we're going to Rotterdam, it's because two years ago, not last year because it didn't take place, two years ago, the Netherlands won. And then the country, if they decide that they are capable to organize a contest like this, the different cities in the country, they present, present like their budget and their plan. It doesn't have to be the capital. But for example, this year is in Rotterdam and not in, in Amsterdam. And uh, I think it's a festival that it was the song festival before when it started. And now it's just like the biggest audiovisual show of the world, I guess, because it unites everything. It unites culture. But for those who really like television, they have the best camera shots and the best realization on TV and the best production. And it feels amazing that if 26 countries are competing in the final with their own staging language, camera shots, they are able to put it together, make it smooth, make it uh, like sounding like a festival, let's say. And it's all of this that make it a, a whole package that now it can be attractive for the new generations because maybe a 16-year-old person doesn't like to watch a festival that it's just an orchestra how it used to be but now it creates a like people can follow it even from before as we are doing it now following the national selection since the internet appeared you can follow how other countries are preparing themselves compare it to yours and you can have your own polls even before starting so it has changed over the years it has had his dark ages also that we can talk about it later let's say uh, but nowadays, it's a concept of TV show with quality, but introducing culture, language, yeah, and music. And um, do you feel that the fact of being created after the Second World War had somehow influenced the fact that, uh, yes, you can bring your own culture, but not your own politics on the, um, the stage? Yes, there's a rule about that. And some of the songs have been banned over the years because it's broadcasted all around. So, of course, if you write a really political lyric, you can get into trouble somehow with neighbor countries who don't feel the same. So... Even though it's like a platform, like it's said that some, more or less it's said that a hundred million viewers can watch the contest every year. So if you have a message to say, and there's been several times that especially in the last 10 years, they talk about pollution, about plastic in the world, but also the LGBT rights. But when they get too political, like pointing at somebody about war in some borders or these kind of things the EBU like the European Broadcast Union who is in control of this contest they always try to avoid when they get too political let's say even though the one that we seeing is may have suffered that kind of discrimination at some point um, they don't allow that and they can even just say they ban the song and you, you know, it's not allowed to take place. Yeah, I feel like from the start, the Eurovision, uh, as it, it was created as a, as a tool, let's say, to bring countries together after the Second World War. Um, yeah, I had, it has this rule about not bringing politics into it, but it was made out of politics, I guess, because after the Second World War, uh, like, uh, the, the goal was to unite and bring uh, all the countries that were also fighting among themselves together again to show that um, also peace could be um, built once again through art and music. So it's some kind in, in some in some way is not just um, a festival, a contest related to music and art, but uh, I think in his deepest roots, 
it's based on on politics just f- from the beginning i guess so every year there is going to be some some song that more expi- explicitly or less yeah, explicitly and, and... uh talk about talks about um some political issues do you have some examples for that yes that's what i was thinking if you take what you just said into the present or into the 2000 decade if you look at the contest now turkey which we all know it's a country that it's not in europe yet and they play in between russia and europe and it's a really powerful country they decided to not participate since 2012 and they said it's because of the voting system but it's obvious that they don't want to get involved in such a contest as, as you know uh, because of their politics and their leader who is not really feeling attached to europe as a, as another country and for example uh, in 2013 azerbaijan uh, you know like the three countries who are in the caspian sea uh, georgia armenia and azerbaijan they more or less uh, joined the contest in 2008 9 more or less and um, they wanted to open themselves to europe and to show that they were able to hold a contest like this and in 2013 azerbaijan won normally they were like doing really good performances ever since they started but uh, you could tell that they wanted to open themselves to europe and they brought a good song but it was not one of the let's say most favorites and there's like still uh, nowadays like uh, saying that if if they won because somebody wanted them to won let's say and there was a scandal saying that uh, Lithuania which is a really small country some representatives of some leaders of the Azerbaijan embassy or some people related to Azerbaijan were giving 20 euro sim cards to lithuanian people to vote for azerbaijan because when you have a, a country with a really really small amount of population if they all vote like uh, they can something in reward it was some scandal that nowadays is still like okay we don't know if it's true or not but the truth is that nobody was kind of expecting them to win and then when they held the contest uh you know there's like this presentation of each country you hold the contest then when it's a night of eurovision i don't know if italy is singing normally th- there's like a one minute presentation of the singer or where the singer is from or they show italy but in that case in azerbaijan it looked like a an advertisement of you of baku of the capital it was like every song it doesn't matter where it came from but they showed one spot in baku to visit so it was like okay uh, they took this contest to open themselves to you and say hey we are here so yeah it's still politics at some point i also feel like after after the cold war i i read that also um baltic republics they also did the same thing because after uh, being um independent to yeah uh from soviet russia uh they used uh eurovision as a um, as a platform to present themselves as uh autonomous let's say nations and to bring and to underline their own identity as um autonomous states independent states from russia and i think in 2001 estonia won and it was like the um uh, like the peak of this like presentation and open uh, to to European Union because um I I also read that Estonians already know knew already knew about uh, Eurovision because they were able to catch the signal the television signal from Finland so they already knew about uh, Eurovision and from 1994 they were able to participate as contestants and and they won in 2001 and they were like super happy about that because it was the first time that they, they could uh underline and, and affirm their own identity uh, as a as a country so we are speaking so far about countries that use the eurovision to somehow create their own identity and to make probably uh, people from other countries to 
have a certain idea about what those countries are. But what about what's happening right now with Belarus? Because there's some sort of, <laughs> as Alex called, called, called it, like he told me about these neologies, uh, Eurodrama, about the fact that the song has been uh, withdrawn or like uh, there, there was some sort of debate around the text. But And now, Alex, you will explain us more. But what I was thinking is that in that case, the song, it's like, um, I don't know if it affects the way we we as foreigners can perceive Belarus, Belarus or if it's like the, the meaning of the song is more referred to the same um, Belarusian citizens. You know what I mean? Yes, I guess. Uh, you mean that uh, we from abroad uh, can get a different meaning as Belarus as if we were abroad? Yeah. Yeah. I think in this case, uh, they made like a statement, the European Broadcasting Union on this group, because as I, you, I'm sure you know more about this if you read the lyrics, they kind of metaphorically gave support to the leader, right? With the lyrics. So it, this is like the said, like the border, you know, like you can talk broadly about politics or peace or war or hunger, but when you, you're, you're trying to make like a, putting your country like nationalistic above the others at some point. Maybe that's when the evil takes part, and especially when it's uh, something as rough as it is now with the conflict in, in, in Belarus. Like, you know, and Russia, for example, uh, some years ago, they passed a law that, pe that LGBT people could not hold hands in the street, I think, or something like this, or not show affection in the street. And... The, the following year, the singer of Russia, there was like the two twins that they were have singing out something totally different. But still, when they went to the stage, all the crowd was booing at them. So there was like, mm, at that point, even the song, people didn't care. But as Eurovision is a platform that is really LGBT friendly, if you bring a, a country that is passing something like that law, you may or lose votes or even lose uh, just followers or it doesn't matter what you bring on the stage and considering that it's Russia, which is a country, it's so powerful and it has so many neighbors in the West side that you can, that they vote for Russia for other reasons we can talk about later. Uh, so yeah, it's not only about the song, but also the position of your country on some topics, if it's more like of an open country or, or... Let's keep on with the thing about the LGBTQ plus community, Alex. What is the, um, in which way you see the representativity inside of the contest? Or of course, Sarah as well. <laughs> it's an open question. Let's, uh, as a global thing, I think, uh, how to say, if you look at Eurovision, uh, it's something that, uh, I don't know, if, for example, such pop divas like Madonna, or I don't know, Kylie Minogue, they have gathered like a broad uh, gay audience, I think, because they, they talk about your topics, they bring, they, they publicly support the gay rights. And with people who have that big impact, you can relate to, but also because it puts together pop music. And this is what happens in Eurovision. It's like the perfect mix between festival, pop music, uh let's say all this glitter diva wigs uh, pants high heels everything that maybe some kind of uh, gay people can relate to so i'm not saying that every gay person needs to like eurovision but of course uh considering it's something that it's broadcasted all around europe or even now in some other countries in the world and they can openly mm, uh give voice to that people not now but even before like the first time it was 1998 a uh, uh, singer from israel called dana internacional uh, she won eurovision being a transgender person and it was something really big back then and since then not only to the gay community but also to transgender people like in 2014 which is like seven years ago conchita Wurst. Uh, he's a man who dresses up like a birded woman and you know it's things that 
you can relate to and that they publicly uh, support. They they just say, okay, this is how it is now, and and like they they show everything and they show everyone. I don't know, Sarah, if you want to add something. Actually, I I don't know what to add because as as I was saying, I it's the first time that I follow the Eurovision, so everything I know is because I read about it. So. Um, I know about Conchita, for example, with uh, that one uh, for Austria a few years ago. And yeah, of course, I uh, I love how these kind of contests or uh, festivals uh, can also become uh, a platform um, to promote diversity. It's amazing. But from the ethnical point of view, for example, uh, Eurovision maybe is still very... Um, how to say that? White. <laughs> yeah, it's still very white. <laughs> yes. But of course, I mean, um, okay, most of the, the nations that participate uh, are from Europe. So maybe one can think, of course, people are white because they're from Europe. But nowadays, I don't think it's the case anymore because many, many, no, many European course. citizens are not white or Caucasian or whatever. So but, for example... Look, for example Yesterday, yesterday, for example, Swedish, the Swedish representative. Yes, Sweden, but it was the mamas, like three black yes. women, giving the giving the the well the, the prize, let's say, prize. to a black man. It was like, yeah, they are yeah. representing Sweden, and we know that in Sweden there's a lot of immigration. I mean, I guess, but yes, I I agree. Like when you see this kind of folk, um, it, yeah, it, it's hard to, to... It's in Europe, yeah. I know what you mean, yeah. The, the thing I considered very interesting, I don't know, Alex, if you can tell us uh, something about other countries, but I was thinking about what's, uh, what's happening with Ukraine that is bringing the um, uh, Goa song uh, called Shum. And in this case, the song uh, is rooted in uh, the traditional folk songs of, the, um, of Ukraine, and it's very interesting the way they decided to transfer the content in a new uh, musical style, like uh, a bit of techno, electro music, etc. Uh, but at the same time, there's this link with the past, uh, with the tradition, which are the lyrics. Yeah, now we can open a whole discussion of what happened <laughs> to the to the lyrics from the selection to the to the real song that they are bringing on the stage. I don't know actually if it ever it ever happened or if it's frequent. It that's like yes. I don't know. As a voter of the song, maybe I would feel like, hey, give me my song back. I didn't vote for this. Totally. Yeah. Like for uh, what you said in the beginning, it's every time more interesting how the the countries who maybe have more like of a rooted folk kind of songs uh, in the eastern countries or Slavic, etc. They bring their tradition and they put it some international uh, electronic kind of vibes and they create like a content that you can relate to. And you're watching TV and you were like, wow, this is like a nice mix. For example, Latvia is doing this uh, this year. I should check the map of which other country is doing this. Whereas there are some countries who directly go for mainstream international, like kind of song, let's say Nordic countries, especially Sweden, Norway, you know. Or for example, you have the case of the United Kingdom who, like, they are the biggest music producers of Europe. I, I mean, the, the most famous band groups are from the UK if you look at Europe. But still, they normally do bad in Eurovision because they do so mainstream kind of stuff like that people don't say like, oh, look at this, you know. And two years ago, Portugal, three years ago, Portugal won with a song in Portuguese, simple staging and a ballad. So, you know, sometimes you don't know what people, people would be connected to, but it, as the message, uh, if, if you get the message, even you don't understand the, the language, sometimes uh, you can connect with the audience. I don't know why I talked about this now, but <laughs> what you were saying uh, about the, yeah, they have time until middle of March to present, let's say, the final version. So, yeah, like, as you said, Ukraine, it was like a four-minute, 20-second song. They had to make it into three minutes. 
and they decided to change a bit like the core I think of the song and this is happening Albania for example is a country that it's always the first country who decides their song because on Christmas Day the 25th of December they held a contest uh, that it's like of a uh, that kind of contest that you watch the, on Christmas, which is on live TV, there's people singing. So the winner goes to Eurovision, but they always sing in Albanian normally and make like a longer song with orchestra. So we all that would be called Eurofans. We know that what we know from Albania on December, it will have nothing to do with the final version. So they are the experts on what we call a revamp. So the, suddenly you have a three minute song in English, more international beat, and it has nothing to do with the original. Yeah, and I was also reading about, for example, you, you said that the UK um, is not very popular on Eurovision because they do this kind of mainstream songs that not really uh, everybody likes. Uh, but I was reading about uh, Sweden. They won six time, times uh, Eurovision. And um, they have, I think, since uh, when Abbas um, won the contest, they have this kind of Swedish vibe that in songs that people really, really like, really, really like. And um, even other countries um, created the song, like the lyrics were uh, were written by Swedish authors because they they are very good at it. So. Uh, in the last few years, they were saying that all the songs, even the ones that were not from Sweden, were very Swedish because of the, the authors that were Swedish. And they had this kind of catchy pop uh, vibe that really attracts the, the audience. Yeah, I, th I think after the United Kingdom, Sweden is the country in Europe that exports more music and they, they produce more more music. And of course, like... When you have to, I mean, it's really hard to, to make a song that you can say, okay, this is Eurovision winner. But if some kind of formula has worked, they go for it. And since Euphoria won in 2012 specifically, there was like, a, it was, a, I know that one is called Thomas Gison and the other Peter Bostrom. Yeah, these two was like a team that they were doing bops, like they were doing hits all the time. So so everyone was going for it. So you could hear a song from, I remember a song from Georgia that looked so Swedish, let's say, so catchy and everything. And there was some years like you say, okay, like let's stop this. But if you watch yesterday, Melody, well, Saturday night, Melody Festival, and half of the producers were the same. And this guy, Thomas Gison, is this guy with a really long hair and he's a producer. He produces almost half of the songs. So <clears throat> my father was watching it and saying like, but this, everything sounds the same. So sometimes, yeah, I don't think, for example, this year Sweden will do really well because they went for a bit of the same. And I feel every year people want something that will stay in your mind. And for some reason, you know, like if you go for the same every, always, the catchy chorus and blah. Uh, you know, people get a bit bored Yeah, it's of it. true. And also, as probably Chiara was saying, uh, if I remember well, like if you sing in English, you can uh, get the audience to relate more with the song, of course, because people can also sing the song <laughs> because they actually can pronounce the lyrics. For example, that's that's my case. I really like when I listen to a song, I really like to sing along to the lyrics. So I really appreciate the songs that are in the native language of the of the country. But if they are in maybe French, maybe Spanish, I can sing along. But for example, um, there is a, a nice song the one that I really like, um, the one from Norway, um, Fallen Angel. I like, I love that song. I, I love the lyrics and everything, but I listened to the, to the original uh, version because I think during the festival uh, in uh, Norway, it was in Norwegian, the, the original song, and then they also changed it in English. And for example, the one, the, the first one I listened to was in English. And then I discovered that the original was, was in Norway, in Norwegian. I was like, whoa, that's totally different. And I really, really like the Norwegian one, the Norwegian version. But I can't sing along, so probably 
If I was one of the, the international voters, I, I wouldn't vote for that because I, I, I cannot appreciate it as I like because I like to sing a lot. What is nice is like there's no, there, there is not a rule to follow. Let's say, okay, I want to have a winner Eurovision song. But if you see like the winners over the years, they are so different. And what is normal, what happens normally, it's last year a ballot, well, two years ago, a ballot won. So now countries go for a ballot. Three years ago, Israel with a crazy song with a girl with the cats on the background. And then they go for crazy, like really, you know, songs. So they want to imitate. But, mm, you know, like also like in 2016, Jamala, a singer from Ukraine, she won with a song that it was uh, having kind of the extinct language in, of Tartar in Crimea and with English also. But, uh, you know, you watch it and it gets to you and you get the message even you don't understand the lyrics and there is not like a formula to follow in order to win and that's what makes it interesting i think because when you have like next week we will have all the countries selected so far we are only waiting for georgia azerbaijan and i'm missing one and malta once this is chosen all the polls will start and people will start to pay because, you know, this like the courses races that people bet. And we will see. This will be a really interesting year, I guess. There's not a clear winner. So. And guys, uh, now that we're speaking about the language, let's deepen a bit into this, this question. Because now we were speaking about the English uh, factor. And um, so uh, at least... I noticed there are two other patterns, like either you decide to sing in your mother tongue language, in the na uh, national official language of the country you're representing, either you go for English, either like uh, there's, for instance, this year, I find it super interesting with what Ukraine and Russia did, because in first of everything about Russia, they chose this uh, singer, Manija. And the, um, the, the winner was announced the 8th of March, International Women's Day. And the song is called Russian Women. So like, uh, there's like this mm, matryoshka of events. <laughs> and, um, so it was interesting to see that the song originally is, um, is sung both like half in English, half in uh, Russian, and also the lyrics somehow, um, compenetrate one each other. So you can understand the meaning even if you just know one of those two languages. And secondly, it was interesting because the same day of the contest, of the Russian contest, you could see the, the title of the song written in Russian, but the real title is in, is in English, is Russian Women. It's super complex, this thing, <laughs> to explain. And um, there's uh, Ukraine that originally selected this song, and it's like uh, totally so sung in uh, Ukrainian. But at the same time, the original title is written in a Cyrillic alphabet, and uh, the, um, the one that now you can find as Eurovision song is written in uh, Latin alphabet. And I feel that this is what makes easier for people do, who do not have a Cyrillic keyboard to find the song because you can write it in a uh, Latin alphabet. Yes, like uh, I feel like um, our countries, like countries such as Spain or Italy, which like the, our, our languages are so rooted and maybe English doesn't have that much presence on our TV and etc. Uh, we would never imagine our singer singing in English if you're representing Italy or Spain. Some years ago, Spain tried to sing in English, and I remember the official academy, Real Academia Española, they just like jumped over the artist and say, what are you doing? And even me, I was supporting, oh, but we need to sing in English, blah, blah. But then, since the really hype of the Spanish music and reggaeton over the, the you see songs in Spanish in the Billboard chart in the USA, uh, like it all changed. And now it's like, okay, we need to sing in Spanish, come on. And of course, countries like Italy, Spain, France, they always sing in their mother tongue. Some Eastern countries, somehow, sometimes they sing also in their national languages, but then you go more to the North, then Germany, Sweden, Norway, Finland, they always sing in English. And I'm so surprised at Denmark 
this year is singing in Danish. I'm so happy about it, even though it's a language that to me doesn't sound really good when sing. <laughs> But yeah, the rules have changed over the years and since 20 years ago, more or less, they can even sing in some language that doesn't exist. I remember there was one time in Belgium that they invented the language. So like, there's no rule about it. Yeah. <laughs> Total freedom. <laughs> also about the Spanish, I think that um, nowadays with reggaeton and, and everything Spanish, it's um, so popular in songs, in music. But for example, I was surprised that uh, Cyprus this year is presenting a song with the title in Spanish. I mean, I think, I think it's because um, they know that Spanish lyrics or titles are very catchy nowadays in music, so they are trying to get the audience in. Look, like that. Cyprus is the perfect example of what we were saying of, let's try to make the perfect package. Like, okay, we put a title in Spanish because it sounds nice now. We take this Lady Gaga chorus, but we take the Swedish and then we do like a video clip that it's like exactly the same of Sara Larsson, like a Swedish singer. And we make, you know, like the perfect package. But to me, even though I can like the song because I like pop music, it's exactly that. It's artificial. It doesn't sound natural. It's not original, you know, it's, it's so international, but it's, it's uh, artificial to me. It's like taking a bit of it. Thing. And yeah, like they want to follow what they did with Eleni Fureira, like they put Fuego in a song, so let's put a Spanish bad title. Yesterday there was a really bad song in Sweden, sorry, last Saturday, called Baila Baila. And, and then it's like, wow, we are Spain, let's do something that we kill the contest and we dance and we introduce reggaeton and we do like a ballad. <laughs> that is so bad. Yeah, I don't get it. Yeah, but, but it's okay, I guess. I mean, yeah. yeah. Uh, also, about Cyprus, I wanted to mention all the drama that come up with uh, the song of this year. Alex, if you can tell us more about it. <laughs> Do we actually want to introduce this bomb in the conversation? Go ahead. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We, we, can, we can keep it very diplomatic. We're living in Greece, you know, like... This is something like related, but you know, for example, Greece and Cyprus, they are countries that it doesn't matter what they bring to the contest. Each country will give 12 points, like the maximum points to the other because they are neighbor countries. So this is a really thing, like what we call neighbor countries. You know, for example, there was like a saying that Eastern countries were always winning Eurovision because they are so small and they have so many neighbors that they were easily catching points from other countries. And like you see that if you see a map of Europe, the voting is somehow behaving in regions. So if you take like the whole Scandinavia, Baltic countries in one side, then the Eastern, then the Balkan, and normally countries who do bad, are in the occidental part, like France, Spain. Come on, we are surrounded you know? by the sea. <laughs> we are kind of isolated. <laughs> exactly. No, but, but also but, because we are we are the big ones in Europe. So of course the, then, the tiny course, the tiny nations are trying to revenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Portugal won three years ago. So like and they are super isolated. So the scheme as I was saying like they say oh we're never going to win. They were saying uh, the ones of the big five which are the countries that were already in the final, Spain, France, Germany, Italy, and the UK, they were saying, oh, they are never going to win because, you know, they, it's unfair. They are straight to the final and not those country not. But then uh, Germany won not that long ago. So whenever there's like a statement or a structure saying, okay, this, then it breaks because Portugal won with the Portuguese song. So... Yeah. yeah, and afterwards, I noticed that many, since I uh, I was studying Portuguese at the time at university, there were many people I knew that were like, oh, where can I find books where to study Portuguese? I want to know Portuguese because I I followed the Eurovision, I fell in love with the song, etc. <laughs> so it has also this kind of effect. That's a really, but that's a really good impact, I believe. Like, it's a positive impact of Eurovision and then... 
we have to preserve it because of this, no, not all because of politics and it's like the positive impact. Yeah. So I, I can understand that we are not talking about the bomb of Cyprus right now. Okay. We are avoiding it. We're avoiding it. Well, let's let's say, let's say if, yeah. if you want to our listeners, if you are interested in some gossip, uh, go f- search on Google what happened with this year song about Cyprus because it's very mm, it's very interesting also like just keep in mind that the title of the song is El Diablo the devil so you, you can I think you can just understand why it was such a big bomb this is the typical euro drama what we call euro drama like it's like the you know it's like a season of the year of the euro dramas and then normally the season starts on March until May the two months before And then, I don't know, Belarusian has to sing the, change the lyrics. Armenia, three years ago, they are not participating in the end because of the war with Azerbaijan. And then they sting with the Cyprus and the, and the church. So, yeah, it's, it's really, if you are into the topic, it's like gossip. It's like really, you can follow each country gossiping. And it- the, the slogan of the Eurovision should be not just a song contest. <laughs> There's so much going on behind the scenes. Yes, it's, it's real diplomacy, I guess, between states. It's real diplomacy because some of them avoid uh, participating to the festival when others are in and such, such a drama. For example, like just some anecdote, uh, I think I told you before, but for our listeners to know, like uh, there's a jury who is taking the 50% of the votes and they have to rank the songs from the first to the 26th song. So... The jury of, I think it was two years ago, the jury of Armenia, the five members of the jury of Armenia put the song of Azerbaijan last. All the five people, they had the same taste. So they put Azerbaijan last. And the same happened on the other side. So when they, when the European Broadcast Union sees such a clear, mm, not fair game, they invalid this jury and they just say okay it's 100 percent televote so we don't count on this jury this is something really interesting because they included jury in 2009 in order to avoid people to choose like song that it doesn't represent good quality music or it's something that it could be a joke but then with the inclusion of the jury the corruption came by the jury because they are, get, they are people who, who can get more favors in between or can get more political. So the voting system in Eurovision, it's a whole new chapter and it has changed during the last years. It's still 50-50, 50% eligible, 50 jury, but they're trying to make the best out of it in order to avoid the neighboring countries to vote each other and the corruption over the jury. And it's really interesting to see the voting of Eurovision and see like, wow, I was expecting, I don't know, Israel to vote for whatever. Then it doesn't happen. It's like, hmm, what? You know, and then you reflect and yes. So let's come to conclusion for this episode. And I'm interested in knowing, guys, if you have an idea of which country could win this year. So let's start a round of answers. Who wants to start? Alex, you can start if you want. You are the guest. Start. Even if we don't uh, still have all the songs from all the countries, but from the ones that we have now, uh, Alex, what, which one do you think is that has the potential to win? Look, last year that it didn't take place, Iceland had the chances to win. And like most of the countries, they decided to pick the same singer this year. But following the rules of Eurovision, they have to change the song. And they released the song on Saturday. And I'm a bit hesitating if they can still win. But for now, as we are missing three songs, I think it could be between Iceland or Switzerland, which is a guy who is singing in French, a ballad, that I think it's really powerful. And if he brings a nice staging, he can move the audience as it happened with Salvador Sobral or as it happened with Dulca Lawrence in the last edition with the Netherlands. So I would be now between Switzerland and Iceland. Nice. Chiara, what about you? Hmm. 
I need more time to think, but if I have to give an answer, I would say either Italy, <laughs> and it's not for a matter of nationality, it's just I feel that the song is pretty powerful, even if it's, it's song is sung in Italian, so maybe like there's some sort of linguistic barrier. At the same time, I feel the energy of the people on the, um, on the stage, and I feel that this can have some sort of impact. Or, Actually, I really like the Ukrainian song, but the original one. So at the beginning, I was sure that they would win. But now, I don't know. Let's see. Let's see how it's going to be. And you, Sarah? I agree with you with the Ukrainian. I, I was going to say the Ukrainian song because it's really, really nice. I think um, it's like uh, some kind of uh, electronic music, but with a different vibe. And also the fact that it came... Um, that it, it has these, uh, this reference to Shom, which is, uh, like a local, uh, indigenous god. It's really, really nice because it combines both, um, modern sounds because of electronic music and also like traditional and ancient lyrics because of the reference to, to Shom, to this divinity. So I really, really like it, but I like, I like the original song more than uh, the one they presented actually for for Eurovision. But if, if it's not Ukraine, I really, really hope for Norway because I like the guy with the big wings. I really like him. So I think we can uh, close today's episode. Alex, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Alex. It was thank an you. amazing chat about Eurovision and I hope also our listeners uh, liked it too. We can link some of the songs uh underneath in the in the description box of the of the episode maybe also our listeners can let us know what they think and which is their favorite one so see you next time bye, bye.